Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Now we by Disney or current Lucasfilm. Legends. Today, we have the Black Fleet Crisis Trilogy. I'm doing it all in one video because I feel like there's not enough to talk about if I talked about it individually. So I'm talking about it here. Non-spoiler. Now, for some reason, people really, really... I mean, there are people who like it, but there are a lot of people who seem to dislike this book as well. They think it's really, really boring. And I can't understand why. I love this book. I haven't read the, the duology, The Hand of Thrawn yet, and I'll probably enjoy that. But as of right now, for everything that I've read in the Bantam era, in the New Republic era, this is right next to Thrawn for me. This is second to that. Well, okay, maybe third if we're putting in X-Wing Rogue Squadron. I, I might put that underneath the Thrawn, then this. But it's really, really good. I, I personally love it, and I don't see why people would hate it. This book has phenomenal writing. The dialogue is excellent. The story, the main story at least, is excellent. Um, there's a lot of politics, but it's not boring. It's the same reason that people like Game of Thrones for like the stuff for the politics when they're talking and for the... I mean, there's not so much scheming in this. There is, but not as much as, like, if you're, like, reading Darth Plagueis or something like that. But I love that. Fictional politics that's similar to ours. So even... This is before the prequels. You even have, like, that, that one political line of the, the vote of no confidence like they have in the prequels. Um... But it's a lot more mature than in prequels because the way the prequels worked, I and mean, some people are like, it's so boring, it's politics, I don't understand it. I'm like, it's made for kids. The politics in it is completely understandable to a kid. And if it's not fully understandable, somebody in the movie explains it. Or they say something real quick and kid goes, oh, okay. They're blocking the planet, whatever. Like, that's all they need to know. But an adult also watching it, can enjoy it more, you know, re-watching as an adult, because now they're like, oh, because it doesn't treat kids dumb, and it also doesn't want to make adults watching it feel dumb, though a lot of people go, oh, it's so boring, I mean, yes, the EU helps um, fill in the politics of the prequels, and makes it so it's, um, for any bits that might be a little bit confusing, it, it, it you know expands upon it and makes it more you know interesting, and it makes it more interesting next time you go and watch the movie. But this doesn't have to do with the prequels. This is you know after Return of the Jedi, and uh, I guess I'll get into the non-spoiler plot synopsis. So, last story we read chronologically was Children of the Jedi, and or not sorry, uh, Planet of Twilight, and it, it's been like a year or two of peace. The Empire hasn't really been doing anything. Uh, nothing's really been happening. It's just kind of, been, kind of been a time of peace. Nothing's really happening. But then uh, we meet these, this race of people uh, called the Yavathan, um, who are these weird-looking guys that have these uh, freaking blade things that come out of, of them right there. Um... And I'll get more into spoilers about that, about what's going on, but um, they're not the nicest fellows, and you'll learn that going into it. Um, and the first uh, first book, uh, Before the Storm, uh, is kind of a slow drag. Uh, it's I don't find it boring. A lot of people probably do. Uh, I feel like the first one is the rising act, or sorry, the the setup for stuff to to happen. But I found everything with Leia and then the New Republic and this new race, I found all of it fascinating. I loved it. Um, we also have basically a spiritual successor to a spiritual sequel, uh, Lando Calrissian Adventure number four. You know, the Lando Calrissian trilogy I reviewed all that while back. Well, this is basically episode, it's basically the fourth book in the book that already has a main story. 
and it really does not at all connect to the main plot at all. But it's good. It is a good Lando tale. If there's one gripe I have with all three of these books, um, it's just that it's so irrelevant that it should have been its own book. That's all. But uh, we also have Luke, who is going on an, an adventure to find his mother, which I'll get more into that in spoilers. Uh, but, I mean, small spoiler, he doesn't, it's not true, he doesn't find his mother, because of course, prequels, she's dead. Um, and then we get to, to uh, Shield of Lies, and we have more stuff going on with, uh, I'm, I'm mainly talking about the main plot, because that's what I care about the most. There's not too much to dissect from the Lando and Luke bits, um, other than what I told you. Uh, I mean, there's some nuance in there, but the main meat of these stories, I feel, is the main plot. Um, and the Vathan society is so interesting. And considering the threat that we're going to face later, this is kind of like a pre-court cursor to that, because they're pretty violent in this, in this, in this series. They, they have people that, um, you know, basically give themselves to this viceroy who literally, like, it, it's an honor to have your throat slit and be dead. But to have, like, the blood be for this person's children. Like, like it'd be an honor to have you slice my throat open. And it's, it's, it's crazy. Um, but the way that he, the way the Viceroy works to, to get opposition toward Leia is all political scheming and stuff. It's really good. And he's also extremely racist. They're, they're very xenophobic. It's, amazing um and and they're a pretty big threat considering and it, there's no there's no real empire in this we have empire equipment ships but no empire in this it's a completely new enemy and i love it uh, of course it gets resolved by the end of this trilogy but um overall the in my personal opinion but now take it with a grain of salt because i believe i'm in the minority here um which is fine a lot of people find these books boring. You might be one of them. But I, for one, found these books to be incredible. They're my number three favorite of this uh, New Republic era, uh, Bantam era of Star Wars books. I I absolutely loved it. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, the only gripes I have, for me personally, is that while the Lando plot is pretty good by itself, Having it shoved into a story that already has other things going on, the Luke stuff is kind of interesting, though it kind of is degraded because we have the prequels now, so of course he's not going to find his mother, and I figured that. You know, I knew it was going to be, you know, false. Um, and so the intrigue is kind of gone there a bit when you know the outcome. Um, but at least the Luke and Lando plot converge at the in the last book. Um, but Lando's plot is so irrelevant to the main plot uh, even Luke's plot, because his character, it, it affects Leia um, earlier on in the story. So it does, uh, it has somewhat importance to the overall plot. But Lando's could just have been booted entirely and you would have missed nothing. That's why I feel like it should have been its own book. But that's really my only gripe. Um, but yeah, because when you're in the middle of, like, when you get to the end of the book and he's like, if you don't do this, we will be at war. And the next book starts and it's Lando for like five chapters. You're like, like, I love you, Lando, but I want to know what's going on with this. I don't, I don't want to be here with you right now. I, I don't want to be in And then the next five chapters are Luke. And you're like, oh my God, can I just get to the stuff, to the best parts first? Can I at least get a glimpse of it first? Nah, you gotta wait a bunch of chapters before you get back to the main plot. <laughs> and it, it just like stopped the uh, momentum for me. And that was the only annoying part. But, um... I mean, and the Luke and Lando plot are fine. Um, they're they're fun, uh, but the main meat was that main story, and I wanted more of it, so it got frustrating. But other than that, these books are excellent. Uh, but I'm gonna get into spoilers now, so if you don't want that, bye bye. Um, so this these books are written by uh, Michael P. Cube McDowell, not to be confused with Sean McDowell or Josh McDowell, the uh, Christian apologists. Um, but yeah, the first book is Before the Storm. Um, 
the flashback starts off pretty dark. And that's why I say this is kind of a precursor to the stuff we'll see in New Jedi Order, because we have a flashback to when the Yavatha overtook their Empire captors and, like, slit his throat and just... I was like, whoa, what book am I reading right now? This is awesome. Uh, and just throw, like, the the intenseness of this new alien race. Um, Leia and Luke being the daughter and son of Vader is now public knowledge. Because they kept that kind of a secret for a bit. Um, but now everyone knows about it, so they're judging Leia. Because she's the president of the New Republic. And they're not very trusting of her now because of that fact. Which is, you know, kind of annoying because, like, she is a hero of the rebellion. Why are you going to question her? Um, oh, yeah. My next note, so political. Yeah, this... I, I for one, am a sucker for it. I loved it in Darth Plagueis, and I loved it here. I love it in the prequels. I love it when done right. And I feel like it was done really well here. It was used super good. Um, Luke's taking a break from being a, a Jedi Master... Uh, and he goes to be a hermit, which is the one thing that really pissed me off about this book. Because I have to be fair here. If I'm going to be pissed off at the new sequels for making him be a hermit, doing nothing. Now, the reasons here are a bit different, but it was still stupid. And I did not like that. I did not like that aspect of his story. Him being like, oh, I don't want to do anything with my family anymore. I don't want to care about them. I'm going to go be a hermit. And I was like, no. No, that's stupid, but he learns from his mistake anyway by the end of this book. He acknowledges it as wrong. Um, but yeah, it was it was very annoying because it's this one of the few one of the gripes. I mean there's many gripes I have the last Jedi, but that's one of them. Um Jason and Jane are now seven now. That's another thing. These books, um or the, the all three of these, you have a little moment. With Han and Leia and their kids. And it's just desperately needed. Because these kids, they're going to have a crazy life. A very depressing life in the future. So these happy moments, I'm really happy I read them. Because they really need at least some happiness. So I'm glad they got this. Uh, in the Crystal Star book, I skipped out simply because... Usually I don't do that, but I want to get to New Jedi Order, and practically everyone hates on the Crystal Star. I, I haven't even really seen that many minority opinions on it. I know there are some that like it, and I'll probably check it out next time I go through the EU, because I plan on finishing this up and going all the way back to the start, and then going again. Um, but uh, I just want to skip it for now. But apparently in that... Uh, the twins got kidnapped. Or, or I don't know if it was just the twins or also Anakin, but they were kidnapped. And it's really sad. Chewie blames himself because his life debt extends to Han's entire family. So the fact that they got kidnapped and Chewie, even though it's not Chewie's fault in the slightest, he, he takes personal responsibility because he takes that life debt very seriously. Which, again, knowing the future... I'm such a freaking saw, uh, weakling, I don't know, uh, baby, because uh, that, that made me tear up a bit, because I know the future, so, um, yeah, but, um, little Anakin Han's loyal, uh, ally, while the twins test his patience, that was just a quote, not a quote, like, quote for quote, but it was something along those lines said in the book, and I, I like that. As I said before, he goes on a search to go find his mother with this person that, of course, will end up not working out. Um, but yeah, um, every part with the kids and the family I loved, even when it wasn't like super happy, I was just glad. And uh, also, uh, Chewbacca takes the Falcon because he wants to go see his family. Yes, the Christmas special <laughs> is canon in the expanded universe because um his family exists his wife and son and he's going to go see them so uh now we get to book two shield of lies 
And I already said, like, uh, that Lando's subplot feels like a sequel to the L. Neil Smith books. Um, and like I said, I really enjoyed the subplot. I just got frustrated when it inter when it intervened from the main story, which I found super compelling. Um, this was really interesting, because I don't think... I don't know if they've actually addressed this before, but 3PO questions his sentience. He talks to Lobot, because uh, Lando, in the last book, he gets Lobot, 3PO, and R2 to help him on this on this mission. Lobot, if you don't know, in Episode 5, there's that bald guy with these things on both sides of his uh, forehead. Uh, that's who he brings. Um, if you know what that is, uh, go look up Lobot on Google. You'll, you'll see what he looks like. Um, but he asked Lobot, 3PO, like, uh, what is, like, the difference between me and you? Because, uh, like, Lobot is, like, a cyborg, so he's human and robot. Whereas, but uh, I just found it really interesting because I, I don't remember 3PO ever asking that question before. And that's a, that is a thing in the Star Wars universe because robots do gain, like, personhood. Um, I don't think that would work in real life. Theological reasons, a soul can't go into a robot. So, uh, plus it's still programming. So no matter how uh, sentient a robot got in real life, um, I feel as if um, it wouldn't, it would, it would still be a part of the programming. Uh, whatever it's able to do would be what the human, I don't believe it would bypass its programming. I believe whatever it's able to accomplish is within the parameters of the programming set in. So even at its most sentient, it's still programming. So I wouldn't consider that a, like, but because people are so stupid, I guarantee you in the future we'll also have a droid rights, robot rights, along with everything else, which would be stupid. Uh, but in the Star Wars universe, it's fiction, so I'm willing to accept it. Um, but there are constant mind wipes to uh, droids in the Star Wars universe. Um, I, 3PO, by the end of Episode 3, he got mind wiped, and we don't know how many, mi uh, how many times he's been mind wiped since before Episode 4. I think since Episode 4 and onwards, he doesn't get mind wiped. But we don't know, in between that time, how often he did. Uh, R2-D2 is the only one who, from the prequel era... Uh, all the way up until Legacy, the comic series, he never has a mind wipe, ever. So he has all of those memories intact, which is why he's the, he has the most personality. Um, but yeah, I just found that uh, super fascinating. Um, Yavasan culture is also super fascinating. Like, the way they go about is so, like, to me, it's primitive. Yet, they consider everyone else primitive and gross and disgusting and inferior. The the viceroy of the Avathan people has to constantly clean himself after talking to humans and other aliens because he finds them so disgusting. He literally thinks that he is defiled by being around them. He'll take like hour long showers to get all of their essence out of them. To get a mate, he looks into a crowd. Points want to come over, grabs her by the head from behind, puts his freaking thing up to her neck, because BDSM or whatever, I don't know, and he's like, you will be mine, and she's like, oh yeah, of course, uh, but she's not, she doesn't feel threatened, she generally is like, yeah, that's good, this is, this is, this is how I should be treated, and it's just so weird, their culture is so weird, yet it's so interesting to read about, um, uh, I already mentioned small moments between characters, I just, this book, I feel like it really understands characters. I've said that about a lot of books, but they do feel like themselves here, so I like that. Not every book they do. Um, I love Akbar so much because um, Akbar always uh, he's always there to mentor and be a good friend to Leia. He even considers himself part of the family to to Leia and her kids and stuff because he's always there for them. He is one of Leia's best friends. And it's, it's so amazing because he's, ever since I started reading the Rogue Squadron series, he has become one of my favorite characters in the Expanded Universe. I, he might be my top five, uh, Admiral Akbar, And that's, that's an amazing thing because in the movies, what did you have with Admiral Akbar? He said, rap, rap, rap. And maybe something else. That's it. Wedge Antilles? He's in a cockpit 
and he says a few lines. Yet yeah, both of those characters have become so integral, so amazing, individual characters on their own in the expanded universe, and that's what the expanded universe does. You have characters that don't get a lot of screen time in the movies, and they're expanded upon, and you end up falling in love with them, and then you go and rewatch the original movies, you're like, yeah, that guy, I love him, because I know him from the expanded universe, I know how amazing he either is or will become. And that's one of the stuff I love about it. By the end of book two, um, Han gets kidnapped, which really sucks, and they, like, beat him and stuff, and it's, it's not a pretty, pretty, it's not a pretty, um, but then we finally get to book three, Tyrant's Test. Um, and uh, Chewbacca finds out and he goes on a mission with his son to rescue Han that was that was really cool uh, the only weird part is we get to see it from like their POV so in a sense so we actually hear like Chewbacca or read Chewbacca talk to his son but so we can understand it it's in English that was weird <laughs> other than that Luke's whole adventure of course was for nothing as I said before um, but the person he was traveling with and her whole story, I don't want to get into it too much. You can, uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. Luke and Lando finally tie in because by the end, uh, near the end of the book, he goes to help Lando. And, um, it's a very nice ending where Luke's like, if I can be that, you know, crazy, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you know, Jedi uncle for them. I want to be. And I'm sorry I wanted to, like, keep myself distanced before. And she says, welcome to the family. And it was just a really sweet moment. And so that is it for the Black Feet Crisis trilogy. If you've already read it, let me know what you thought. Even if you thought it was boring, I'd love to know. If you enjoyed it, let me know your reasons for it. Um, if they're the same reasons for me or not. Um, and uh, let me know... Um, just let me know your thoughts in the in the comment section below. Um, I really enjoyed this trilogy. I thought this trilogy was amazing. Uh, at, at least the main plot. The other stuff was okay. It wasn't amazing or bad. Just it was good. But the main plot was was amazing, and I loved it. Um, but yeah, that's all the time I got for today. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. Share my episode a ton. And up next, we have the new rebellion. And then after that. Move on to the Krillian Trilogy. And then after that, we finish it off with the Hand of Thrawn duology. Um, we don't finish off our series here, but we finish off uh, the main main stuff of uh, the Bantam era. So, hope you look forward to that. See you then.